So now we come on to the topic of magic. And we have 50 minutes, which is a short time. So we're going to have to make it intense. And we have videos as well. Inshallah. So just take a minute or two to get yourself ready. Okay, I'm going to try and keep this um, relatively child-friendly. Um, we're going to talk about magic. It's not really very easy to do. But if anyone is concerned, um, the videos are probably where it's going to be not very nice. And I will try and let you know what's going to be in the video before I show it to you. And if you're particularly queasy or you're particularly, um, uh, you know, sort of... Um, uh, worried about how you might feel watching the video, you might want to turn away and you might not want to watch it. But I will let you know beforehand, inshallah. If we can just have everyone quiet and down now, inshallah, so that we can uh, begin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Okay, I'm just going to use this to help me along. Um, this is not my presentation, and it's not in English either, but it has some very useful uh, things in it. I get to the right bit. Okay. So, we want to just zoom back a bit once it lets me. I think I think that's why I'm using it in the wrong. I'm using forgetting the Arab, Arabic goes the other way. Okay. So we want to talk begin by talking about a history of magic, a history of magic, and the first place you can see up on the map is Babylon, ancient Babylon, and you can see here a picture of some of the uh, uh, ancient uh, Babylonian relics. And Babylon is, of course, a particular area that is mentioned in the Bible and is mentioned in the Qur'an. And the people of ancient Babylon were known for uh, a particular um, kind of magic that they were well known for. And that is that they were well known for their use of stargazing and magic. So they, they, they ha there is a relation in the magic of ancient Babylon between stargazing and astrology and magic. So they're well known for their astrology and they're well known for their magic. 
And they used to worship the seven stars of Babylon. The seven stars. The seven stars of the people of Babylon. So we need so far, we know they were well known for their astrology. They were well known for their magic. And they were well known for their worship of the stars. They used to seek nearness to their gods through three things, particularly through the use of incense, the use of knots, and the use of sacrifice to other than Allah. And their books are full of the mention of magic. So we have one historical source of magic, which is the people of Babylon. And we have in there their knowledge of the stars and magic, astrology, uh, astrology, their worship of the seven stars. They're coming close to their gods through the use of incense, knots and sacrifice. And that they have many books written on the topic of magic. Now we come to Egypt. And as you can see there, we have a picture of Egypt. And we have some Egyptian hieroglyphics and a mask of or an image of uh, Fir'aun. The Egyptians were well known for using in their magic hieroglyphics, symbolism and magical words. Hieroglyphics, symbolism, and magical words. They have many manuscripts and scrolls that are written in hieroglyphics depicting the carrying out of magic. Their religious class of people, the religious caste, among them were well known for the practice of magic, i.e. the ancient Egyptian religious caste were a people who were well known for the practice of magic. Some of their kings were also known for the practice of magic. And likewise, uh, they... um, were in uh, a particular uh, area or a particular, there was a particular place where they were known for the magic that they uh, did. And you all know the story of Fir'aun and Fir'aun and the magicians and how that came about. So this is uh, sort of indicating the ancient magic that took place in Egypt. Now we come to Persia. Okay, so we come to Persia. These were a people in ancient times who worshipped Allah alone. They were not a people who worshipped other than Allah. In the most ancient times, they were a people who worshipped Allah alone. Their great military commander, Rustum, was one of the people who first introduced stargazing and astrology to the people of ancient Persia. And they have this um, uh, this uh, famous sort of um, symbolism that we're going to find, we should be able to find a, a picture uh, of, um, which they would use uh, in their, their magical practices, and we can show, we're going to show you some symbols from that later. What about magic in Islam? So now we're coming out of ancient Babylon, ancient Egypt and ancient Persia and talking about magic in Islam. Magic in Islam is represented by letters and numbers, symbols and signs that relate to uh, the, the, the stars. They relate to the, the, um, the, the zodiac. So we're talking about letters, numbers, 
symbols and signs that relate to the zodiac. They added to the ancient magic of Egypt, Babylon and Persia, they added disgracing the Qur'an and attacking the Qur'an. And likewise, we find that a number of uh, the innovated uh, or the innovating sects in Islam also using the practice of magic to fulfill their aims. We're going to show you an example now, and I'm going to go into this later, but this is an example of um, symbols, numbers, and writing that is there in order to um, in order to perform the magic, and we're going to talk about how that works in a second. Likewise, we're going to see another example here. This is Babylonian magic, the seven stars of Babylon. And we're going to see again an example of modern uh, Islamic disgracing the Qur'an and attacking the Qur'an through the supposed writing of Ayatul Kursi in a way that cannot be understood uh, and can't be comprehended. So that is one part. We're going to show you some videos in just a second. But we want to begin just before we if we just have the lights on for just about five minutes while we just go over some theory. And inshallah ta'ala, then we can talk about and show you some of the videos and some of the practicality behind it. So I want to explain to you magic in the light of an ayah in the Qur'an. And that ayah in the Qur'an is the 102nd ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And they followed instead what the devils had recited during the reign of Sulaiman. It was not Sulaiman who disbelieved, but the devils disbelieved teaching people magic. And that which was revealed to the two angels at Babylon, Harut and Marut. But the two angels do not teach anyone unless they say we are a trial, so do not disbelieve by practicing magic. And yet they learn from them that which, by which they cause separation between a man and his wife, but they do not harm anyone through it except by the permission of Allah. And they learn what harms them and does not benefit them, but the children of Israel certainly knew that whoever purchased the magic would not have any share in the hereafter, and wretched is that for which they sold themselves if they only knew. Five points I want us to take out of this ayah. Number one, magic is something that can be learnt. Magic is something that can be learnt. Magic is not something that you are born with. Number two, magic is an act of disbelief. Number three, magic causes real and significant harm. It does not just cause illusions. It doesn't just cause you to, to see something that's not there. there. Number four, there is no harm without the permission of Allah. And number five, there is no such thing as good magic or white magic. As for magic in the sunnah, it is narrated that Aisha radiallahu anha said, a spell was put on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Until he imagined that he had done a thing when he had not done it. One day he made dua and he said, Do you know that Allah has shown me in what lies my cure? Two men came to me and one of them sat at my head and the other at my feet. One of them said to the other, What is ailing the man? He said, He has been afflicted by magic. He, the other said, Who have bewitched him? He said, Labid ibn al asam He said, With what did he perform the magic? Said with a comb, the hair that is stuck to it, and the skin of the pollen of a male date palm. He said, where is it? And he said, it is in the well of Darwan. The Prophet ﷺ went out to the well and he came back and said to Aisha, its date palms are like the heads of devils. 
Aisha said, did you take it out? He said, no, Allah has healed me and I feared that it might bring evil upon the people and then the well was filled in. What is the nature of the magician? The nature of the magician is that a person cannot become a magician until they reach the highest forms of disbelief from which there is rarely any return. The shaitan lures them with promises of riches and fame, begins by asking very little. Once the person is hooked, the shaitan does not let them out of their grip. They must perform the most evil acts in order to remain as a magician. And in reality, rather than me telling you, I'd like to show you. And I'll tell you what's going to be on the video beforehand so you know whether you want to look or not. while it loads. So we're looking at what the magician, the actions that the magician does, the things that the magician does, in order to practice the, you know, the evil that they do. So we plug this in. Okay, what magicians do. So let's start by looking at the cave. This one is fine. This one's not going to upset anybody, inshallah. Uh, there's nothing in here that's going to be particularly um, particularly horrible. And as I said, I'm going to try and avoid the worst of them because I did have people fainting in previous one, previous uh, lectures. Okay. Here you can see a magician describing and showing to the people how they perform their magic. And it makes no difference where in the world they are from. Magic is one religion and it's one, one way. There is no two ways about it. So you see this person has made a circle and they've created an altar at the front. The altar has magical symbols in it and symbolism. Each single symbol has a purpose. Each color of each candle has a purpose. You can see in there there is a, a little shrine at the front with a triangle. And the use of the circle and the triangle is going to come later on. You'll see that very clearly. Each of those candles has a purpose and a reason. And what this person would be commanded to do would be to sit inside of the circle for a prolonged period of time in a cave. And this is just showing you the cave in which the person would be sitting. They're going to a place known for the possession of the jinn, known to be isolated. They're sitting inside of that cave and then they are going to be sitting for such a prolonged period of time, lighting the candles and beginning to mention the name of the shaitan. Call upon the shaitan and invite the shaitan to come to their presence. So they begin by lighting the candles and by sitting in the circle and by reciting their words, but not words of the remembrance of Allah, but words of the remembrance of the shaitan. And instead of playing you the whole thing, because the time is very short, what we will do is just forward it slightly to see what this person is doing. So they sat in a state of... They would sit in with the upper part of their body exposed and they would begin to mention the name of the shaitan and to call upon the shaitan. And they would usually be asked to relieve themselves in the same circle that they sit in and to sit in their own filth. That's one. But that's the lightest one. I thought I'd test your, you know, your stomach first of all. That's the lightest one. Now let's go and have a look at what magicians do with the Quran.
This one is this one is is horrible to see, but it's not. It doesn't contain anything particularly horrible in terms of, you know, something gory or something like that. This is a public sewer. It's full of you know waste and excrement, and they're trying to fish out something from the public sewer. And we're going to keep going, and the sheikh he climbs down into it and this is what they pulled out of the public sewer as you can see this is a copy of the Quran that has been used in a public sewer it's covered in human filth it's covered in sewage and they now have to clean and purify this copy of the Quran Just in case you thought that was a one-off, we'll show you another video. This one has 51 copies of the Mus'haf that have been disgraced by the magicians. As you can see, they are covered, these are all copies of the Qur'an. They are covered in knots. They are covered in filth inside of them. They're going to open one of them up. They're covered in pins like voodoo dolls. They're cutting them open and you see the state of the Mus'haf inside. You can see the color of the water that is coming off of the, the uh, copies of the Qur'an as they're washing them, as they're opening them. And they're washing them with uh, rose water and they're washing them with uh, perfume in order to to remove the, the uh, excrement that was on them, and they were found in a toilet, in a public sewer. 51 copies of the Mus'haf. And you can see inside the state that these uh, Mus'ahif have been put in, and inside there are metal nails uh, bent over. These are part of the magic. And you can see how covered these uh, Mus'ahif are in, uh, in, in dirt and in, in uncleanliness. Right. Now that I've, uh, I've started uh, to get you used to it a little bit, I'll show you one that is really quite... I would suggest if you don't... Uh, this is probably... A, this is not a nice one at all. However, it's not, it's not the worst one we have. So it's not... I mean, shouldn't... What you can see here is a copy of the Qur'an and you can see a, a circular... I don't know what to call it, a device... And you can see what the Qur'an is smeared with. The story of this is actually much, much worse. Whatever you can imagine, the story is worse. There was a, a maid who wanted to perform uh, magic upon the family that she was with. She took a copy of the Qur'an, she placed it into this tube, and she placed it where she placed it uh, when she was on her monthly cycle and she covered the Qur'an in menstrual blood. This is what magicians do. Here we're going to see another magician. And this magician is going to show how he, again he's been caught, and part of them being caught is they ask them to sh they they ask them to show what it was that they were doing without letting them make shit. They don't let them call upon the shaitan, but they just let them show the idea of what they were doing in order to expose them in front of the people. So the first thing you see is that this man is wearing. I won't forget that this man is wearing red from head to toe. He's wearing red from head to toe because the Prophet ﷺ forbade a man from wearing red from head to toe. He lights his incense that is done deliberately to bring the shaitan. It's, not, it's a kind of incense that's well associated with the shaitan. And he begins to perfume a whip and he starts to whip himself. This might remind you of some people. <laughs> and I'll make no further comment than that.
But he doesn't do this for Ashura, he does this every single day of the week. Now what you can see there is curtains on the wall that again he has disobeyed the Prophet ﷺ by placing curtains all over the wall. And what you see here is blood stains on the curtains. Now what he would do is he would sacrifice a rooster. The rooster that the Prophet ﷺ said that when the rooster crows, that it's seen an angel. The rooster that's associated with the calling of the people to the Fajr prayer. They would sacrifice a rooster to other than Allah. To sacrifice a rooster to the shaitan and then allow it to flap around the room, spreading the blood all over the walls. The blood that is the blood of that, that, that has been used to, to worship other than Allah. And then you would see what this person would do. They have some more little tools that they use. They would then lie in a position of humility and a position of, uh, of lowliness. And you're going to see. And they would stay in that position calling upon the shaitan. Calling upon the shaitan to appear before them, calling upon the shaitan to help them, calling upon the shaitan to aid them and to support them. And what they do is they make a contract between themselves and between the shaitan. They make a contract between themselves and between the shaitan. And this contract is then placed in a number of places. And I'm going to show you some examples. This here is a bird that was confiscated from the house of a magician. And you can see stitched into its wing or onto its tail. I've got all sorts of them, this one. That's stitched onto its wing. You have uh, either a, a, a written uh, piece of paper with the magic written on it, or you have various strings and threads that have been blown, the magic has been blown over them. I think the other one is a little clearer, so I'll put the other one on. So this is another, uh, another bird that was confiscated from the house of a magician. And you can see very, very clearly there that it has stitched into its wing uh, a contract that is written between the magician and between the shaitan. You also have an example of their burying the magic in the graves. So they go out to a grave and they dig inside the grave. They've caught a magician or they've been informed by a magician as to where the magic is hidden. And you're going to see that they bring out from the grave. They've been told what side of the grave to look at and they bring out usually a plastic bag and the bag has various magical items in it. You can see there that you have uh, the letters and the symbols that we're going to talk about tomorrow and you're going to learn about what all about what they those symbols and letters mean. We'll show you another one that comes out of the grave. This is right in the base of the grave, in the middle of the night. They call them out because they've uh, heard that there's some magic buried there and they keep on digging and digging. And eventually they take out this pouch. And they start to open the pouch. And we're going to see what's in it. That looks like somebody's vest. Inside you have uh, a, an egg which is painted or coloured red may well be blood, and has a number of needles stuck into it. You have um, a tissue, a man's tissue. You have a lemon. You have the head of an animal that was sacrificed to other than Allah. And 
And it's not uncommon for them to put inside of the head of the animal some magic. And you have these writings, uh, you have all sorts, it's covered in blood. You have um, a child's nappy in there. And you have a sanitary towel. So you can see the sanitary towel in the middle, you can see the child's nappy over to the side, you can see a vest, you can see a handkerchief, a male tissue, a bunch of pins inside of the egg. And there's uh, some Qur'an in there as well. And we're going to count the number of pins. You can see in there that there are seven pins. Okay. Having had a look at that for a moment, and I'll just briefly show you some of it that's buried in the water as well. You can see they're dredging the sea at Jeddah. When the people come for Hajj, some brothers here came to, with me to Hajj, you would think that the people came to Hajj to worship Allah, but there are a whole bunch of people who come to Hajj in order to put magic in the sea near Mecca, because it's greater in disgracing the Islam and the Quran by putting it in the nearest place to Mecca. Okay, let's switch the lights back on and let's try and analyze a little bit of what we've seen. So, here we see, um, we saw a number of things. What did we see in that last one that was open from the grave? We saw, I think it was, there was a, a vest, there was some kind of clothing, there was a sanitary towel, there was a nappy, there was a lemon, there was an egg, it was coloured red, there was blood, there was a male tissue, there was uh, seven pins. Each individual item that was put in there was put in there for a reason magicians don't do things at random they do very very evil and very horrific things but they don't do them at random it was put in there for a reason and an aim in order to bring the shaitan and cause a problem and i'll tell you what happened the the story of this the sheikh who, who gave me the video he actually was involved in the case and he told me the story he said what happened was there was a woman who had been divorced by her husband and she had lost custody of her child. She went to a magician in order to bring her child back to her. She brought her own blood. She brought the child's nappy. She brought some clothing from her husband and his tissue. And she brought um, an animal and the animal was slaughtered to other than Allah. And I want to make something very, very, very clear. The magician in the beginning would do these horrible acts, and they would leave Islam, and, and they, would, you know, they would sell their soul to the shaitan. However, there's a problem. Once the magician has done that, what's next? The magician says, calls the shaitan, says, I'm willing to make sajda to you. In order for me, you to do something for me. And the jinn and the shaitan say, well, what's the point? You've already disgraced the Quran, you've already left Islam, you've already done the worst of the worst of the worst. There's nothing left to ask from you. You've left Islam and there's no Islam left in you, so we have no need. What, 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 what is next? So then he says, what can I do for you next? to make you obey me or to make you carry out my orders once again. And so the shaitan says, now you have to bring other people. It's not enough for you to leave Islam. Now you have to bring other people. And so that magician goes out to convince other people to use their services and to bring them, those other people, outside of Islam. And this is something that you see amongst the magicians is that they don't simply disbelieve. They disbelieve and they become a da'iya, a caller to get people to leave Islam. And so that woman was asked to bring an animal knowing that animal would be sacrificed to other than Allah. 
in the beginning, don't think that this magician sat there with horns, you know, like, and sat there saying, I'm an evil magician. In the beginning, the magician enticed her, look, I can solve your problem, I'm a healer. But when it comes to the crunch, you're going to have to bring me an animal to be sacrificed. She knows and he knows that animal is going to be sacrificed to other than Allah. When he asks her to bring a sanitary towel, he asks her to bring a nappy, she knows what's going to be done with it. But he has to get her to make that step so that she would leave Islam. And when she leaves Islam, then the jinn will now do another act for him and would afflict her husband and cause him to lose the custody of his child and for the child to go back to the mother or afflict the husband to make him love the woman again and make her come again uh, to uh, back uh, and bring the family back together. And of course it should be mentioned that they never bring anything good. They never bring anything good. And they never, ever, ever um, are successful in what they do. وَلَا يُفْلِحُ السَّاحِرُ حَيْثُ أَتَى The mag- magician will never be successful wherever they are. So they do these acts, and the husband would go insane, fall in love with his wife once again, go back to his wife. Within a few months, he will have fallen out with her again. Because magic never works. Of all of it, the stuff that they do, it doesn't bring anything but evil for everybody. It doesn't bring people back together. Magic can be done for a number of reasons. Those two reasons can be summarized by two things. Sarfun wa'at. Pushing people away and bringing people together. Pushing people away is, if you like, what, what people term evil magic. All magic is evil. But what people term black magic or evil magic, magic that's done to harm, magic that's done to kill, magic that's done to push away, magic that's done to destroy, magic that's done to break up a family, that's one thing. On the other side, magic that is done to bring people together, and it brings nothing. It brings nothing together. It, it doesn't do anything. Like the magic to protect someone from the shaitan, magic to give someone health, magic to cure someone's illness, magic to make someone love someone, and all of it is done the same way. All of it's done by disgracing the Qur'an. All of it's done by pushing people away from the path of Allah. This is the reality of the magician. But now we come to a very important point, And that is that the magician will not appear to a person as an evil shaitan, as a devil. The magician is going to try to get people to become confused and to follow him through appearing to people with the most outward action of piety. So you would see, and a brother, when I mentioned this in East London, they told me a story just a few weeks ago in East London, that they came across a person who was a magician. And he was handing out cards telling people that he does black magic. And then they, they, you know, they, they ignored him and whatever. He was handing out cards on the street that I can heal, you know, that I control the shaitan and all of the... You know, clear magician. And you know where they found that magician? They found him when they went to the prayer in the masjid. They went to the masjid and they found him sitting in the masjid doing his magic upon somebody in the masjid. And that's not surprising. These people don't have any limit. Don't think that they live in caves. You know, they go to the caves to learn their magic. And then they come back from the cave and the guy grows a nice long beard. And he puts on his best thobe and his, you know, his little hat and everything. Because this is how they get their business. I'm a healer. I'm a pious person. And we're going to talk tomorrow in the session about the Raqi, about who is a, a, a true Raqi and who is a fake. Who's a magician dressed up as a healer and who is a real person who is helping people for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But these magicians, they come out to people with an apparent nature of piety. You know, showing people that I'm pious, I'm good, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm able to help you, I know Allah's greatest name, I can give you something, I can write something for you that will educate you, I will give something that will help you, I can heal you, I have power, I have dua that is accepted, I have a shaitan that I can control, all of these different things. So they appear to people as being pious and being holy. And in reality, it's very easy to see the difference between them for the one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the ability to do so.
So we understand how magic works. How does magic work? Magic is an agreement between the shaitan on one side and the magician on the other. The magician agrees to do certain things for the shaitan, and then of course the shaitan agrees in return to do certain things for the magician. Usually, this magical contract is written down. And the first thing we're going to do tomorrow, and please do come on time, we're going to cover the written symbols the magicians write down. You saw that open from the grave with all the letters on, lam, 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 ha, 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 ha. What does it mean? What is it there for? Inshallah ta'ala, you will learn about. We're going to talk about destroying magic, of course, in the, uh, in the uh, Rukia session. But very specifically, if you do find the magic itself, destroying it will destroy the magic completely. Because at the end of the day, the jinn are only there because they have been commissioned to be there. They are there because they've been commissioned by the magician. The magician has done his acts and the jinn have done theirs. And therefore, the jinn are only willing to remain as long as that written...